rewind time. The year is 1901. Guglielmo Marconi installed a telegraph in a steam carriage made by the Thornycraft Company. The system was pretty primitive, and uh, the antenna, wow. But it opened people's minds to what could be possible with mobile systems. In 1919, Popular Mechanics, wait, Popular Mechanics is that old? They wrote, practical and useful radio equipment for automobiles is not far away, and had visions of telephone poles on each of the car's four corners. In 1922, Chevrolet came up with a super cumbersome way to bring radio to their vehicles. The radio system had a huge control box, external batteries that fit under the seats, two large speakers that fit in the back, and an antenna that covered the entire roof of the car. Car radios were available in the 1920s, but their high cost made them out of reach for most car buyers. A young engineer by the name of Paul Galvin, he figured if he could produce a tube amplified radio that was affordable, he would become rich and fat and be able to light cigars with $100 bills. And that's all anyone really wants, am I right? Galvin found investors and built his radios with his brother Joseph then installed it in a Studebaker and drove 800 miles to attend the annual Radio Manufacturers Association meeting in Atlantic City. He turned his radio all the way up and stood on the back of his car, taking orders for his new invention. It worked because Galvin's radio cost less than half of the other radios on the market at the time. Two years later, in 1930, the Galvin Corporation came out with a newer, battery-powered tube-amplified car radio called the 5T71 a portmanteau of motor car and Victorola. Motorola. The number of cars that had radios went from 34,000 to over 3 million. Not everyone loved it though. Legislators from Massachusetts and Missouri proposed bans on radios in their cars, and in 1934, a poll of the Auto Club of New York revealed that 56% of members thought radios were indeed a distraction. Wait a minute. Uh, Do I hear music? Gavin Brothers, watch out. Radios, yeah, they're the future for real. We should probably try to put them in our automobiles. But Paul, anytime we do business, it fails. I ain't trying to be a hater, but we shouldn't be in sales. Not to mention, radios cost a lot. But if we make them cheap, then they're gonna buy them by the box. We got the tech, the funds, let's stay the course. We failed three times, this ain't gonna be the fourth. You was right. Yeah. Dope invention. Thanks. You should show it off at that radio convention. Yeah, park it in the front. Tunes crank loud. Hop up on the hood and attract a whole crowd. Step right up. I got something to say, yo. Come and get your hands on this Motorola radio. And everybody's got a radio on their dash. Drivers love our radio. Like, like we, we love cash. cash. Bumping in the Chevys, the Beamers and Benz. Went from selling 30 stacks to selling 3Ms. Radios everywhere. Drop tops and coupes. Everyone was happy except for one angry group. We think they're a nuisance. They're putting us in peril. Cars are made for driving, not for Ella Fitzgerald. They tried to ban our radios. Hey, it's in two different, different states. states. But the car makers loved them. It was, it was far too late. too late. Have I mentioned that yet? That everything up until this point was AM radio? It wasn't until 1950 that a German company by the name of Blaupunkt came out with an FM radio. FM is much higher quality than AM radio. The Blaupunkt stereo was the first car stereo to offer FM, but a company by the name of Becker stole their spotlight a year later with their Mexico car radio. This AM FM radio was the first with a scan function that let the driver autonomously search through radio stations until they found one that they liked. This function wasn't available on any other car radio until almost 10 years later. If you wanted to listen to music in your car, you were pretty much at the mercy of radio DJs. That is, until Chrysler debuted their Highway Hi-Fi system. This compact, proprietary record player played Chrysler-made seven-inch vinyl records. But surprise, surprise, the Highway Hi-Fi system eventually failed to sell enough units to keep producing it because it's a record player in a car. It skipped like crazy. Oh, and it also exclusively played records made by Columbia Records. It was like the title of the 1950s. The 1960s are when things started really taking off, and I'm not talking about rockets to the moon. In 1962, an entrepreneur by the name of Earl Madman Muntz wanted to create a product that encompassed his two loves, 
cars, and music, and came up with a four-track cartridge. The cartridges, also known as stereo packs, can play an entire album from start to finish and didn't skip, play ads, and they didn't need to be rewound. The Infinite Loop cartridge was specifically made to be played in Muntz's other invention, the Auto Stereo. The units were expensive, but unique and state-of-the-art, which made them wildly popular with celebrities at the time. Bill Lear, owner of Learjets, had bought some Auto Stereo units with the intent of distributing them and installing them in his jets when he had an idea. Lear had actually worked at Motorola decades earlier and re-engineered the Auto Stereo and came up with his own system, the 8-Track. The guy who started Learjet also started 8-Track. Lear's system cut costs by making the cartridges less complex. It was wildly successful, and soon the 8-Track was surpassing the more expensive and less impressive sounding 4-Track. There's that damn music again. I'm Madman Months, I'm a big celebrity. I'm known for selling radios, cars, and TVs. AM, FM radio has plenty of fans. But what if car owners could have music on demand? Ta-da! Look, I made a tape with four tracks. An endless loop of audio, call it Stereo Pack. Listen to your favorites like Cream or Ringo Starr with the auto stereo. You can listen in your car, bro. Name's Bill, and I'll buy your four track sets. I have plans to install install them in my jets Bill Lear as in Lear jets heard of me I'm a big deal in the aviation industry see all this cash that you make off my jet setters so I'm stealing your idea and I'm making it better Bill what the hell I thought we were friends friends no businessmen People love your stereos, but they want more. Mine will have eight tracks and be cheaper than yours. Compact cassette tapes debuted around the same time as the four track. The cassettes produced by Philips were more expensive and less common than the four track or eight tracks, but offered better sound quality and Dolby noise reduction. Eight tracks won the public over due to how inexpensive they were. Plus, they had the backing of Motorola and Ford, making them more readily available than cassette tape. In the early 70s, cassette quality was improving massively, and the differences in audio quality between cassettes and 8-tracks was undeniable. Plus, cassettes had one big thing 8-tracks couldn't offer, the ability to record customized mixes. This proved to be the deal breaker that led to the 8-tracks ultimate demise. During the 70s and 80s, the production of aftermarket stereo equipment exploded. Advances in technology led to many new products that improved on stock car stereo designs. Car owners wanted bigger, better, louder stereos, and they got them. In 1976, Pioneer introduced the KP500, the creme de la creme of car stereos. Look at this thing glow! This cassette slash AM FM radio had advanced circuitry for the time and was marketed as a premium aftermarket stereo with super sensitive tuning capabilities. The head unit wasn't the only thing being customized. Audiophiles were also swapping out, upgrading, and adding more speakers in their cars. Powerful amps that were too big to hide were put in the trunk, along with subwoofers. And before long, you could hear the flatulent buzz of a sub from down the block. In 1982, Sony and Philips debuted the compact disc. Fun fact, a CD can hold 74 minutes of audio because executives of both Sony and Philips loved Beethoven and wanted the format to be able to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in its entirety. But the compact disc wasn't much of a sales success right off the bat, and was met with widespread skepticism. Pioneer didn't listen to that noise though, and saw the potential power of CDs in their car stereo systems. In 1984, they came out with the world's first car CD player, the CDX-1. It was considered a luxury item at the time and wasn't affordable to most, but the sound quality was undeniable. Drivers reveled in the 10 disc changers and loved that they could skip tracks with the press of a button. CD players were strictly aftermarket systems until 1987 when Lincoln installed the first OEM CD player in its 1987 town car. CD players slowly gained more popularity throughout the 90s as prices dropped and more people could afford to install them. But cassettes weren't going out without a fight. Yo, we in this thing together, right, man? Hell yeah. All right, all right, let's show them how we roll in. We, we pretty much the same thing, right? Yeah, for sure.
I'm so futuristic, gotta read me with the laser This mix that I made for my girl gonna amaze her I'm made out of rainbows, you just plastic Yo, you said we're not bad I'll s*** Oh, it's like that? Bro, you whack One little scratch will end your life like that Hit you in the teeth Knock out your dental Unspool your guts with a number two pencil I'm unforgettable You so pitiful Little kids stick their fingers inside of your middle hole I got that high fidelity Your world is in danger Me and the whole crew inside the 10 disc changer I'm not obsolete I ain't that much older Shut up, you played out Time to flip your butt over Look at your reflection, bro. You look stupid. I don't gotta burn you. I'll let a teenager do it. Yup. 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 <laughs> CDs were on top. That is, until Apple came out with the iPod in 2001. Dude, remember those sweet commercials with the dancing people? I'll dance right now. Oh. MP3 players had already existed since the late 90s, but none of them were as easy to use or as aesthetically pleasing as the iPod. Plus, they had a 5 gig storage capacity, which meant you could hold all your Nelly Furtado albums and your Moby albums on one device. That's so convenient. Car manufacturers were pretty slow to integrate MP3 connectivity into production cars, but that didn't stop car owners from buying aftermarket stereos with auxiliary ports. CD sales started declining, and rightly so. You could carry hundreds of CDs worth of music on a device as small as your phone. Radio had been passed up by cassettes and compact discs, but it was about to make a comeback. It took five years of lobbying the FCC and an additional five years to raise money to send satellites into orbit, but finally satellite radio was launched. Sirius did this almost single-handedly. Nowadays, streaming services reign supreme. Satellite is still offered in many new cars as a premium subscription service, but car owners prefer services like Spotify and Apple Music, which have 40 million songs to choose from. What the future of car stereo looks like is unknown, but one thing is for sure, music isn't going anywhere. Upload complete. It is the year 3 million AD. We are born with every song installed in our heads. We are legion. We will conquer the stars. I'm eating global breakfast. I gotta get in my spaceship. I hope there's not space traffic. It usually jams up around Crab Long 9. Donut Media is its own planet. I still write, but videos are smells now. <laughs> 50 episodes of Wheelhouse. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you guys like this one as much as we liked making it. It was a ton of fun. Hit that yellow subscribe button right there. Also, big, big thank you to Henry for directing this and uh, just helping out with the music and all that. Check out this episode of Wheelhouse. Check out this episode of Up to Speed. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. Be nice, I'll see you next time.